everyone. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for attending today's Lunch Bunch, where our goal is to learn a whole bunch in just one lunch. My name is Isabella Silver, and I'm the Director of Development and Programming here at the Jewish Federation of Tulsa. This is our largest Lunch Bunch to date, so I want to extend a huge thank you to Chef Veronica Berkowitz for preparing today's lovely spread. As always, we really appreciate when you make your reservations in advance so that we can make sure to have enough food and chairs. As always, programs and other programs and services that we offer here at the Jewish Federation of Tulsa wouldn't be possible without the ongoing support of our annual campaign. We are just a few weeks into our 2024 campaign, and I thank those of you here today who have already made your pledges and gifts for the year. I would now like to introduce the great Eva Hunter. Some of you may have heard Eva's story. Some of you, this may be the first time. The Jewish people promise that the Holocaust shall never happen again. And with what we are witnessing right now in Israel is just one example of why history and education is so important. If you want to show your support in remembering the hostages who have been in the hands of Hamas for 110 days now, we have Bring Them Home Now t-shirts and dog tags available at the front desk. Itzik, do you mind standing? You're our model today. Itzik is wearing his t-shirt and dog tag, so you can pick one up on your way out. They are available at the front desk, and proceeds go back to the families of the hostages and to the Swords of Iron campaign. Eva, I will now pass it to you. After Eva finishes her story, we will open it up for Q&A and I will be passing around another mic that I ask if you have a question that you use and then Eva will answer. So thank you so much for being here. Eva, thank you. Thank you, Isabella. Can you hear me? Is the mic on? Can everybody hear me? Wave or something so I know. Okay, well, uh, thank you Jewish Federation of Tulsa and thank everybody. I thank everybody for being here. It's amazing how many people did show up on this foggy day, and I will do my very best, even though I am not feeling great today, but I, I am happy to be here. So I will start at the beginning. Uh, I was born in 1932. I am ancient, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I was born in a large city, Lodz, L-O-D-Z, in Poland. I was an only child. My family were not wealthy, but we were comfortable. My father was a businessman. He and his dad had an office, office machines wholesale place, new things like typewriters and so on. And uh, I was about ready to start first grade. We didn't have kindergarten then. And unfortunately, just before that, I was told by my parents that even though I had all my school supplies ready, I would not start school because I was Jewish. And Jewish children were not allowed to go to school. That was September 1938. By the way, if I miss a date or repeat myself or in any way don't measure up, to your expectations, please forgive me. I am on medication for sciatica pain and I am, I'll do my best. Anyway, uh, so there I was, a little girl looking forward to, sc to school uh, and not allowed to go. I wasn't allowed to go outdoors and walk on sidewalks. I wasn't allowed to play with my non-Jewish friends. And from then on, the situation became worse. Uh, my grandma Volman, who, as I mentioned, lived with us, was ill and never could become used to this new type, new kind of life we had. My grandma Kaffeman came from Eretz Israel, then Palestine, to visit us with the return ticket back. Uh, shortly after the invasion and occupation, 
we were ordered to move, we were to relocate to what became known as the Lodge Ghetto. Most people know about the Warsaw Ghetto because it was more famous and in films and stories. It, it was the same thing. There was barbed wire around the neighborhood. No one could come in, no one could go out. When I was a little girl, I had a nanny, a Polish Christian woman whose name was Furmankova. And she used to bring food from outside the ghetto to us. She loved me and I loved her dearly. And then she was no longer allowed to, to come and I have no idea whatever happened to her. After spending four years in the ghetto, does everybody here know what the ghettos in occupied, in Nazi occupied Europe were? Let me see if people know what it is. Oh, okay, those who don't, look it up because that was a terrible, terrible time and place. But we stayed there for a long time, which I was very fortunate. And maybe if I, again, if I repeat myself, I'm sorry. My mother worked in a soup kitchen. And so, as I said earlier, I always had the extra potato. As the ghetto uh, population was relocated, more people from all over Nazi-occupied Europe were brought to the ghetto. You could hear every language spoken. And we stayed until the last transport. We did not know where we were going. My parents were told that we were all going to work in a metal factory in Germany. But I recall when we left home and walked to the train station, and I remember the train standing there, which was not a train that I remember having traveled in. Those were uh, these red color cars that were used actually before that, not for humans, but for transporting other things. We were made to go in there and we were shoved against each other as tight as we could. No one could sit down, there wasn't enough room. We stood against each other and there was a tiny little window on the side, way up high, and some people tried to see what was happening, where we were going, why are they treating us so badly? No water, some bucket in the corner for the toilet. How were we, why were we treated like this since we were going to work? Well, unbeknown to us, we arrived at a awful place and I remember so well when we were told to get out of the, of the cars quickly, schnell, rouse. We were, which that, at that time meant nothing to me, but we were in Auschwitz. And we were immediately separate, men and women, uh, men and women separate, and most children taken away. I had no idea what was going on. Mother held on to my right hand, and we kept walking quite a distance, and then came to a large building where we were told to go inside, and we were being processed. There were women sitting, SS women, sitting at long tables. We were told to take all our clothing off, and our heads were shaved. I had long braids. And I remember touching my head and mother saying, hair grows back, it will grow back, we'll be okay. I was one of two children only that were lucky enough to get there. I don't have to tell you, you know what happened to most of the Jewish children. Children represent the future. And of course, the Nazis didn't want any Jewish people to have a future. So you know what was done to the children. They were taken directly into the gas chambers and then their bodies burned. And I remember the smell, of a weird, weird scent in the air. I didn't know what it was then, but I do now. It was burning skin hair. We didn't stay long in Auschwitz. 
Then we were again relocated to a camp, every bit as terrible, but less well-known, Stutthof on the Baltic. And it was in Stutthof, or maybe I already mentioned that, that my grandma Kaffeemann was killed, and mother and I stayed together. She worked. We stayed there a long, long time. After Stutthof, some of us, the original group from the Lodge Ghetto Metal Factory, including us, my father was not a metal worker, neither was mother, but they had connections. Remember, in order to survive, you had to have connections and be resourceful. Those are the two words that meant survival, resourcefulness and connections. So we were taken, am I repeating myself? <laughs> Have I told you that we were taken to Dresden, the large city in Germany where we worked at the metal factory? I and mother worked the same shift. Uh, I was sorting bullets on a conveyor belt one night in February 1940. Five, when the city of Dresden was bombed. It was terrible. This cannot be described. Everything was on fire. But the Nazis, the guards, never lost track of us. During that horror of the, of the bombing, one young woman managed to escape. They found her. They brought her back, and we had to watch as she was killed. I won't go into the details of it. It was, of course, horrible. Uh, we stayed there uh, after the bombing for a short while on the meadow outside the city. And then we started what is now known as a death march. They walked us. Uh, through towns, through villages, this raggedy bunch of people barely able to walk. It should not be called a march. We just dragged on. And I should have told you that after Auschwitz, when they took our clothes away, we were given this striped, uh, rough, striped kind of uniforms and wooden shoes. And we walked in these wooden shoes. A nail embedded itself on the side of my left foot, and I cried and asked mother if we could stop so she could take the nail out. The SS woman said, nine, and you didn't argue with that. So mother dragged me all the way till we came to a soccer, open soccer stadium where we spent the night. She got the nail out of my foot, out of the shoe, tore a piece of her dress or whatever it is that she wore and wrapped it tight around my foot. And it's amazing, I never had any uh, blood infection. There is still a little scar there, but that was minor, all things considered. And uh, we kept walking until we came to a place uh, called uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm suddenly losing it. We came to, uh, say it again. Theresien or Theresienstadt. Am I repeating myself? I apologize. I don't know if it's the Advil or if it's my mind that's just giving out here. It's both probably. But uh, we were liberated, as I've said, on May 8th. 1945 by Russian soldiers. And uh, it, it's beyond description, those of us who have survived. First, we wanted to eat food, food, and the Russians gave us, they were throwing these chocolate bars at us. And not having eaten for so long, we, we ate everything. And of course, some people became ill from it and continued eating. and. Then it was looking for our family. And lucky, lucky for me and my mother, 
my father was brought to the same Theresien, Theresienstadt on a different route than we were. Men and women were never together, so we were reunited. That's the short version of the story. Should anyone want to really know this story, please go on Voices of Oklahoma, type in my name, and you will hear me speak much better than what I have done now and in more detail. Uh, so thank you very much. Are there any questions? I hope they are, and I'll be glad to answer whichever I can. I'm sure I've left stuff out, but that's the best I can do right now. Could someone, wait a moment, please. I cannot hear you. Here, here. Isabella is coming with the mic. It's Janet. It's Janet. Can you tell us just a little bit about what happened to you and your parents after the war? Isabella, can you please come and tell me what she said? I couldn't yeah. hear. So do you know, can you talk about what your parents and you did after the war? Right I'll be glad if you want to. Jeff, thank you, Jeff. Sure. Thank you so much for being here and repeating. Uh, what, my, what did we do then? What, what were all of us to do? There we were. Many people, those who survived, of course, wanted to go back home. But word came back that the Poles didn't want us back. They took our belongings and didn't want to part with them. So first of all, I should tell you that my father was very ill right after uh, liberation, and we were taken by the Russian soldiers to Prague in the Czech Republic. And we were treated there wonderfully. I cannot find words to describe my admiration uh, for the Czech people. Hotels were open, restaurants, we were given clothes. I remember taking my first bath in four years, if you can imagine that. And so there we were in Prague, and now what? Like I mentioned, people wanted to go back, and many came. Many go back to their homes, many were returning and telling us that no one wanted us, and most people then ended up, of all places, in Germany. You maybe know about this. Uh, and there were, Germany was divided into American, English, French, and Russian zone of occupation. Everybody wanted to be in the American zone. The Russians weren't very friendly. Uh, the Americans were known to be friendly, generous, kind, and the DP camps were set up in the American zone. I was never in a displaced person camp because uh, well, different circumstances, but we ended up, mother, dad, and I, near a city called Stuttgart in western Germany, trying to reach Switzerland, because the only relative my parents knew uh, who would have survived was our uncle in Lausanne, Switzerland. So that is where we were trying, that's who we were trying to reach. You couldn't then buy a ticket, train, or, or airplane didn't exist, or people were just hitchhiking and walking any way, any, anywhere they tried to reach. And also, some German soldiers were returning from the East. Many had amputated leg or arm, and it was a very difficult, difficult time. And uh, we came to a town uh, on, a, on a truck, actually, hitchhiking, called, as I mentioned, Stuttgart. And the truck driver, it was, it was at dusk, he said, you're not going to find a place to sleep in Stuttgart, it's all bombed. But we're approaching a town called Ludwigsburg, which is only 14 kilometers from Stuttgart, and you can probably find a place to spend the night. And the custom was then in the American zone that you'd go to the city hall and the mayors who were installed by the American uh, forces would help those of us who traveled through the town. And indeed, there was the mayor 
His name was Herr Böhringer. Uh, he was actually French, uh, but we were the only people, the only survivors who arrived in this little town. So he took particular interest in, in us. He assigned us an apartment for the night where some high-level Nazis escaped the day before. There was still food in the kitchen. It was as if they just just left in a big hurry, which is, this is what we did. And that's where we, that's where I remember first sleeping, as I said, taking a bath, sleeping in a bed with pillows and blankets. And just so happened that, uh, I think I was asked to tell about our store, that uh, all the shops were closed. And American soldiers, were known as souvenir hunters. And so the mayor realized that my mother was quite a strong woman and he had an idea. As mayor, he could get some shop that was close to reopen and he had connections to get some merchandise. And mother, dad and I set up shop in Ludwigsburg, gift shop. And the name of it was Valeria, which was the name of the mayor's daughter. And I recall spending evenings writing souvenir of Germany on empty cardboard boxes, on pencils, whatever we could get. And the word got around that there was this store open. So the American soldiers th that lived on that base would line up early in the morning sit on the sidewalk in front of our store, we'd sell whatever we had, go back home and make more merchandise. That is how my parents started a gift shop, which eventually became a real store when other stores opened. And the American soldiers were still stationed there. And one day, uh, a soldier came in and my mother, who, she didn't speak English, but if they didn't understand her, that was their problem. She spoke, you know, whatever. <laughs> she noticed that this one so soldier that came wore a little mezuzah. Instant family, right? So she invited him to dinner. Well, that happened to be her bunterman, who, as you know, I eventually, we got married. And that is how I came to the well, first to Canada and then to the United States and to Tulsa, which has been my home since 1963, I believe. Long time ago, Tulsa is my home. My children were born and grew up here. Questions? We have one right here. When, before the end of the war, did they not try to separate you from your mother? How were you able to stay with her all that time? During the war. How was I able to stay during the war with my mother? Very few children did. In our lager, in this big barrack, there was only one other girl way back there, and we never got together. We were not supposed to be noticed. I was very, very lucky. That is the only way I can describe it, that my mother made it through the, uh, the separation, the taking the children away, just incredibly fortunate, and I still am. And it is in, the, in memory of those children, all the children who were killed, they didn't die in their beds, they were murdered, they were killed. It is for them that I, find it that I must tell the story. When did you laugh? After going through all of that horror, when did you find yourself laughing? When was your first moment of joy? When did I find myself laughing? First time you laughed. That's an interesting question. I have never been asked that. In an odd way, and this is really, it was a nervous laughter. It wasn't normal. But when we were in the shop, in the room before going into the showers, when they 
shaved my head. My mother touched it, and it was a nervous laughter, but she laughed, and we hugged, and we laughed, and she kept saying, hair grows back, we'll be all right. So it was at that moment, and I don't remember after that uh, much of laughing until after the war, of course. But I was very fortunate having a strong mother, having survived, and, uh, you know, so thank you very much for wanting to know my story and, of course, the story of all those who survived. I believe that uh, as far as having been a concentration camp, at this point, I'm the only person in Tulsa, and that's quite a, an obligation. I feel humbled and, and by it. So if I'm not making much sense tonight, blame it on the Advil and I will do better the next time. Eva, I had one more question. Uh, uh, it's John Seeler. Uh, over at the uh, museum next door, I know there's a picture of your mother and I, w I was wondering if you could tell the story of how you found that picture of your mother and, and how it came to be. That's a very good and interesting question. Thank you, John, for asking that. I have always, after the war, of course, when I, didn't, I lived in, well, in this country, I enjoy going to bookstores and browse through the bargain tables. And I was visiting my daughter in Ann Arbor and went to the first borders that was actually, that started in Ann Arbor, and it was a huge place, and there were all these bargained uh, books on long tables, and as I looked through them, I turned a page of one of them, and there was a photo of my mother. I mean, I couldn't believe my eyes. There she was, and that's the large photo that you are referring to. Uh, I bought all the books that they had, and I have donated some to the museum, some to schools, and the book is the diary, the title is The Diary of David Sierakowiak, a Jewish, Polish young man who was in the ghetto and who died of tuberculosis. I believe he was 18. So that is a book, if you can, I urge you to read it. It's by uh, Ellen Edelson. Actually, it's only part of Edelson found because part of the book that was found in the ghetto, part of the paper was used for heating a stove. So this is not a complete story, but it's, it's definitely worth reading. So if you have time and you enjoy reading, you can probably get it online also. The Diary of David Sierakowiak. Other questions? I'm over here. Hi, my name is Aja Lyons and I'm a PhD student at Oklahoma State University. Um, I'm also a writer and um, sometimes I write fiction about Jews, but I'm considering um, veering into nonfiction. My question, um, glad we're trans transitioning to books. Um, do you ever read any books or view any films um, about, about the Holocaust and what would you say maybe things they get right or things they get wrong or what writers could improve on? What was what, the question? What, what kind of uh, books that, that maybe you've read that other writers have missed the mark and in, in, in what, uh, what they presented? Well, I have read many, many books, and of course, now that my, uh, I, I'm not able to read, I listen to audiobooks, and uh, there are so many that, are, that have been written and are still being written. There are some people who didn't give their testimony till recently. It was too painful to remember. So uh, my interview for the Shoah Foundation was beautifully done by Michelle Weens, who is here. Michelle, raise your hand. Thank you, dear. You... <laughs> that was many years ago. I don't remember how long ago, but it is still, it's out there. So those people who know how to maneuver your computer, I know could, could find it, and, or parts of it anyway. 
they are many very good books. I could not start telling you right now, but go online and, okay, two sites. Maybe I have already mentioned. Uh, Yad Vashem has great information and so does the uh, U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. Who has been to the Washington, D.C. Museum? Oh, wow, then you know, you know what how much information there is and how very well it's done. Has anyone been to Yad Vashem? You have too, okay. That was quite an emotional experience for me when I went there. And you remember, you go through this dark tunnel sort of with photographs and stories of, of ghettos and camps and then you walk out and there is beautiful scenery of Israel. It was, it's, it's a magical place. And we continue. We don't give up. We go on wherever we are. It's not always easy, but that is what one has to do. That's what survival means. Any other questions? No? Anything I missed? Janet, Michelle, Jeff? Can you think of something, Nancy? I have a question. I could just go up there and grab it, but I'll wait to see what's around. This one has a little thing on it. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Jenny Graham, and we met before. Yes. There is a lot of war happening, a lot of anger around politics happening. But with the Holocaust Remembrance Day coming up, what do you want people to remember about your story. How do you want your story viewed in light of these other things happening? Thank you for the question. Uh, what I always tell the students, by the way, I usually speak to students. I'm not used to adults like this to speak to, uh, is never give up. That's the one thing, never give up. You have to be, uh, you have to Put up with whatever and make the best of any situation. Uh, and for young people, you know, they are not going through what I did when I was a teenager, but they have their issues. Stay with it, figure out. And the other thing is respect other people who might, as I said earlier, uh, have a different skin color, different hair, different whatever, speak different languages. Uh, get to know people individuals instead of just a whole group which doesn't really lead to much information and there are all these stereotypes that we're always dealing with. You get to know a person and uh, you'd be surprised how much you have in common. Anything else that I can add to it? Uh, Thank that, you. Sure, Jenny. And read, by all means. Reading is still in, you know. Even so, some people say it's, it's a thing of the past. I don't believe that. There will always be books written, and there are so many. And it's, besides informative, it's a pleasure. It's, it's wonderful to sit down with a good book. And there is much written about the after. Uh, I am right now listening on my computer to a story called The Last Million. Has anybody heard about that? No? Very interesting. That's after the war. It's, the, uh, it's all the people who survived and telling their stories and, you know, all kinds of people who were prisoners, people whose families were lost during bombings and all that. Very good story. Anybody, any suggestions of what we should be reading? Janet, are you somewhere out there? She's my reading lady. Someone has a question. Okay. Hi, Eva. I have a question for you. So you enjoy reading a lot. I'm wondering if you could tell us how and when you learned to read um, and what, when you found the joy of reading. Jeff, can when did you? did you find the joy of reading? I think, oh, this is an interesting question because after the war, I ended up in Germany. But up to that point, I only spoke Polish. I didn't know German. So I, and I didn't, 
I was 11, never gone to school, to a regular school. So what do you do with an 11-year-old kid who is just getting her hair growing in and doesn't speak the language? Well, I went to a bookstore. And I don't even know if I knew what a library is, but I went to a bookstore and found a very pleasant woman there and told her in my broken German that I want to learn to read in German. And she suggested some books. And somehow I taught myself through osmosis or something. I don't remember <laughs> sitting down and learning, but I picked it up. And then once I had the basics, I did learn a little grammar of German and, uh, and then English, of course. And uh, so read. There is really no excuse not to. Uh, who has a suggestion? So have you read something interest, an interesting book lately? There is someone, yes. Uh, it's called A Long Way Home. And Bob Gohan, who lived here, okay, escaped the Nazis and his family in Poland up to Siberia. And uh, he started the Israeli Air Force, and he and his brother got split up, and uh, they all found their way back to uh, Israel. But it's a great book, very easy. It is a wonderful story of a Tolson. It's his biography, autobiography. Very, very good. A Long Way Home by Bob Golan. Does anybody remember Bob Golan? Yes. So he was originally from Poland, but he lived in Israel. He, it's, it's quite a story. And he fought in the Israeli Air Force. And very, very good book. Anything else that you are reading? Mm -hmm. I have not read that, it, but it's an intriguing title, isn't it? Uh, fabulous, fabulous. It is People Love Dead Jews. Isn't that a weird title? <laughs> and uh, I hope that some people like living Jews also. <laughs> but uh, yes, anybody else has any suggestions? Well. Any questions? Anything that I left out? Some of my friends here might know something that I didn't tell, just like Janet knew about our store. If there is anyone who knows something that I didn't mention, please let me know. Tell them about how you cook for your husband. <laughs> oh, no. This must be Brian, is it? <laughs> I cannot really see, but no one else or very few people know the story. Uh, as I mentioned to you, I met my husband. He was a customer who came into our store, and I didn't know him well. And then this soldier stationed in Germany left after a few months. And after a while, we, continue, we wrote to each other, and eventually he suggested that I maybe come to the United States and we could get married, and easier said than done. Because you should know that when it came to moving out of, moving to the United States, you were on the quota of the country of your birth. I would be still waiting. I was on the Polish quota. But I went to the Canadian consulate and did somehow persuade the men that there that it's a long story, something that uh, I lied, OK? I told them that I've always wanted to live in Canada and blah, blah, blah. And I got a visa to Canada. And Herb met me in Toronto. We were married. And he lived in New York. I had to stay six months in Toronto with some family, distant family of, of his. And then we were finally reunited. And uh, the first thing we did, or some, it went, I went with his parents, actually. They took me to a grocery store. They explained to me what an Idaho potato was. <laughs> I mean, I'm from Poland. We ate a lot of potatoes, but they were small red potatoes, not these big things. And I learned all sorts of, I had to learn quickly. And then they, uh, we went to Sears and bought pots and pans and set it all up. What I was interested in doing with all this is to line it up on the shelves, really pretty, with a little rick-rack kind of. But it never occurred to me that those pots and pans were supposed to be used. 
I didn't know how to cook, and I didn't know this guy I just married well enough to tell him that I didn't know how to cook. <laughs> so what Brian remembers, this was in Charlotte. We lived in Charlotte, North Carolina. There was a restaurant that, you know, we went to a couple of times very close by. So what did I do? I took my pots and my pens and I went to that restaurant and brought food home, set it on the stove. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> And he complimented me, Herb, oh, those are the best, whatever it is that I happen to make, happen to make, happen to be bringing up. And I realized then, hey, we can't afford this. We were constantly broke. I was using up. So there was, Herb managed a store there, and uh, the woman that worked as the cash, at the cash register, uh, she and I became sort of friends, and I confided in her. And she says, well, I'll show you how, what to do. She took me to the grocery store and told me what the things were and then would call and say, okay, there is this oven, turn it on 350 <laughs> and clean one of those big potatoes and put it in the oven. And this is how I actually learned to cook. But I didn't tell him for a long time that I wasn't, you know, he kept asking, what about those, whatever it was, cutlets of some sort? And I said, yeah, I'll fix them the next time, you know. <laughs> so, but eventually that became a joke in our family that they're still talking about and remembering. <laughs> Any other stories? That's it? There's a hand up somewhere. No? Oh, uh, Isabella is going up there. I just finished a wonderful book called We Must Not Think of Ourselves by Lauren Grothstein. Uh, that is the story of the people in the Warsaw Ghetto who formed a group to write their stories so it would not be forgotten. And it, it's a great book. What was the question? It was a, about a book she, she was reading. And what's the title again? We must we must not think of ourselves. We must not think of ourselves. Okay, I'm not familiar with that one. But, uh, you know, there are lots of stories that many of us who immigrated for one reason or another to the United States have lots and lots of stories. Some are very funny. And if you have time, I'll tell you a fun. I think it's funny. When I stayed in Toronto, which was to be for a short time because I was married to a U.S. citizen, well, it turned out that I had to be there six months. And so I decided sometime after a month or two, two months or so, that I ought to get a job. And now what could I do? My, I worked in a retail store, as I told you earlier, I made the merchandise that we sold, and I thought, okay, I will apply for a job as a salesperson. So there was this one store that I noticed, it was quite exclusive, ladies wear, and in those days, uh, the fabric of choice was very much the black crepe dresses. Old folks like me remember that. So I got a job there. I mean, unbelievable. They kind of thought I could maybe do this. First, I didn't want to sell anything. They, the other people loved me because I kept folding things and doing stock work as long as I didn't have to approach a customer. But eventually, they said, the next person comes in, you have to talk to her. So I did. Hello, you know, the whole routine, may I help you and so on. And she wanted a dress, a black dress. So I bring out a couple and I touch the fabric of one and I say, please feel it. It's such a beautiful piece of crap. <laughs> this is the German word for crepe. I had no idea while other people started laughing just as you did now. But that was my start in the retail business. <laughs> Eventually, uh, when we came to Tulsa, I did get a job at Brooks Brothers and stayed with them happily for a long time. But before that, I should mention, I was the director of Temple Israel Preschool 
for 10 years. And there might be some people here who perhaps attended that school or know of someone who did. It was a great experience. There is a hand up there somewhere. Who is it? Jeannie Jacobs. Oh my goodness, hi. Hi, yes, well, uh, so nice to, for you to be here. And so my career in Tulsa was first uh, as a preschool teacher, and I loved it, and I did it. I started actually when my daughter was three years old. And then it was Brooks Brothers, and while I worked at Brooks Brothers, I once got a call from someone at the Jewish Federation, which I really didn't know many people that worked or were affiliated with the Federation, telling me, I'm at work, mind you, that there is a, someone from uh, the government, uh, what was the senator who was doing the, the ads for hearing aids? Do you know who I'm talking about? Or Congress? Who? What was his name? Steve Largen. He came to the temple because he just saw Schindler's List on television. And he was outraged why they showed nude bodies. You know, so they called me, I'm at work, if I would please come to Temple Israel and speak with this gentleman. So I thought, of course. And so I did. And he was very pleasant, but he, he was offended by it. And I suggested that he study the Holocaust because we all were nude at, at the time of processing. And there was, he just didn't get it. He didn't understand why that was shown. And so actually after, after that, we became good acquaintances. Hi, Eva. I have the last question. It's Isabella. Okay. In addition to Jenny's question at the front of what you would say today in light of the war happening now, you often say it all begins with words. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, thank you for asking that. You see, I, am, I should have mentioned that. I, that is a fact. Everything starts with words. Just, just remember your own lives and what, how you approach someone, how you get your news, what it starts with words. And we have to be very careful about what we say. Not just to be polite, but what effect can our words have on someone, particularly on young people. I know that at times when I speak to students, there'll be someone crying in, in, in this little audience in the group. And because there was a word mentioned that affected that person that deeply. So yes, it starts with words and we have to watch what we are saying instead of just whatever pops into our mind. So I think that is important. Thanks for asking that. Any comments on that? Why it starts with words? Any teachers here? The power of words? What we say? No? Well, you all know what, what that means. Yes, there is one arm up there. This is Itzik. I just want to say about words, when you say something, think about toothpaste. Once you come out of the tube, you can't put it back in. So if you say something, too late. I'm sorry? Just use of the power of words that you can't back Very well said. Yes. Once the word is out there, it's out. So the only thing, again, is to think ahead, especially talking about serious subjects, you know. A joke now and then, I think it's, of course, all right. But when we say something to an audience or to an individual, we need to know what it is that we mean that we are saying. Can we all give a round of applause for Eva, please?